I thought we might be hearing it in French, but that was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much, Miguel. You know, it, it's hard to sing up front, let alone sing a cappella up front. So that's wonderful. Well, um, thank you to all of our, our supporters today for our worship team and, and uh, for our AV team getting some of these things sorted out. Thank you so much. And uh, it's just great to see everyone pull together so we can have a, a wonderful time of worship together. Amen. I, uh, I wanted to mention, uh, if anyone, uh, especially of our moms that are here today, if you want another flower or you, maybe you want to exchange your flower, you're welcome to come get more flowers. Or maybe you're going to have lunch with someone later on today that's a mom. Um, please, you're welcome to any of these uh, flowers up here because that's the purpose they're for. And they, they won't be able to be enjoyed or appreciated much longer as it is. And I do want to say a special thank you to Lisa Heise for uh, making sure these flowers were here. So thank you, Lisa, um, for doing that for us. Uh, special here for, for Mother's Day. Would you pray with me? God in heaven, we turn our thoughts to you, Lord, and we know that we have, you have been here with us and, and we have been uh, in your presence from the time we came uh, into this place today, Father. But at, just at this juncture, Lord, as we make this transition uh, of contemplation, Lord, that you would, uh, you would open up our minds and, and our hearts, Lord. Uh, no one needs to hear from me, God. There, there is nothing I have to offer that is of any value. So I pray, Lord, that it would be your spirit that speaks. It would be your word that is heard in this place today. So God, uh, thank you so much that we can spend this time as a family together. And I just pray that, uh, God, everyone be blessed for being here. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, I, I did decide to kind of tie the theme. We did teacher's appreciation last week, and the, the sermon was teachers indeed, and I tried to emphasize that teachers are ministers, that they stand in the gap. They're actually types of Christ in a way. They follow in the footsteps of the rabbi who is Jesus Christ, and so I uh, had a, a, a dedicated time uh, talking about teachers last week. I can't promise that every time there's a special recon, uh, recognition on a weekend that the whole service will be arranged around it, but this week I decided to uh, also um, uh, have my sermon be dedicated to the moms and, and the mothers uh, and, and to spend some time reflecting on motherhood, uh, which I know so much about. It's just something I, do, I know. It's just wonderful. <laughs> no, I'm just going to share some thoughts, and, and I hope that it's something that, that does uh, speak to you, and, and I, think, uh, I think there's so much that we can uh, learn together. But I do have my kids' quiz, so I'd love to have some help from the kids. And uh, last week it was a teen trivia because the kids were out with uh, Children's Church, but we're going to talk about some moms here today as part of the kids' quiz. She's the mother of all the living, but had no mother herself. Who are we talking about? <clears throat> she was the mother of all the living. I actually saw Ryan. He beat you, Gloria. Sorry, Ryan got it first. <laughs> Ryan, what do you say? What's that? Earth? Mother Earth? Mm, it's not Mother Earth. So that was a, a good guess, though. Gloria. Eve, Eve, sometimes the sister, you know, she gets, you know, my sister's name is Eva, and that, you know, that, that's rough. No, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's Eve. Yeah, she's, she's called the mother of all the living. That's kind of what her name means. And, uh, but of course, she, she was made uh, by God and, and didn't come uh, into existence in the way that you and I did. So that's very interesting. She laughed when an angel told her husband that she would have a child in her old age. Oh, Addie, I know you wanted, I saw the hand. Okay, I, I'm going to go here in the back. Um, oh, you told me your name, but I've forgotten it. What's your name? Harley. Yeah, what do you got for us, Harley? You're right. That's correct. That's Sarah. Sarah eyes, her name was just getting uh, amended at this time. And yeah, she kind of gave a giggle. You know, what are you talking about? I'm going to have a baby. That's ridiculous. But that's the story. That's what happened. All right, her twin boys started wrestling in her womb and continued to fight with each other all their lives. You know, I thought twins were supposed to get along. I thought that was the way it worked. But in this case, there was uh, some real issues. Who was the mom here? Who was the mom here? Saw a hand jump, and now there's some hesitation. Was that air? Did I see a hand over here? Uh, I, okay. We've got a lot of nervous ones here today. Okay, Addie, I see it now. 
It's not Rachel. Sometimes Rachel gets confused with her. Go ahead and try again. L Leah? No, it's not Leah, but Emma may know for us. It's Rebecca. Rebecca. A remarkable. You know, we don't know as much about Isaac and Rebecca. There's not as much biblical record as there is of Jacob and Rachel and even Abraham and Sarah. But what little we know of Isaac and Rebecca is really quite wonderful. Their, uh, their relationship in the Bible is really a beautiful story. So this is Rebecca. All right, next one. She died in childbirth and named her second son Ben-Ani, but her husband changed his name to Benjamin. Who are we talking about here? Okay, Toby, you, you had your hand up. No, it's not Rebecca again. I, I, I can see that. I want to give the kids a try here. All right, okay, Paul, we're going to go with you this time. Rachel. This time it's Rachel. This time it's Rachel. And you see that I on the end of Ani, that means son of my sorrow. Remember last week we talked about rabbi, it means my teacher. Anytime you see I in, uh, in Hebrew or in Aramaic, it's a reference to the pronoun my, son of my sorrow. But Jacob called him son of my right arm or son of my strength, which is an amazing thing that when, when Rachel died, Jacob renamed his son or did not embrace the name Ben-Ani, but went with Benjamin, son of my strength. There's a, there's a lesson to be learned in that as well, but we'll We'll look at that another time, maybe. All right, last one. Last one. You ready? Proverbs is a collection of wise sayings written mostly by Solomon, but Solomon credits his mother with much of the wisdom. Isn't that nice? What was her name? We always think of the wisdom of Solomon. Well, where did he get that wisdom? We know God blessed him, of course, and that was one of the gifts, but he did get it from mom as well. What was Solomon's mom's name? Parents, you can, you can help out, whisper it to your kids, or, okay, that's all right, unless I've stumped you as well. <laughs> okay, Addie, you're on top of it today. Who are we talking about? Say it again. Bathsheba, is that what I heard? I thought I heard it. You are absolutely right. What a remarkable thing, this individual that comes into the story in such a dramatic way, and uh, Solomon's mom, Bathsheba. The journey that she had. Well, um, you know, the Bible has a lot of amazing moms. It really does. But we're going to talk about one mom in particular uh, today, and that's the very first mom in the Bible, Eve. Eve is the very first mom in the Bible. And so it just seemed to reason that there are some things we can learn about motherhood, from Eve and in the, the dramatic story of the creation of the planet and Adam and Eve and everything that happens and then ultimately the fall. And we're going to do this kind of in a storyboard way. We're going to look at Eve in Genesis 1. We're going to look at the story of Eve in Genesis 2. And then we're going to wrap it up with highlighting uh, how Eve is portrayed in motherhood in Genesis 3. Okay, we're going to do that kind of in what's called storyboard fashion. And I know that you're extremely familiar with these verses, but you know, sometimes when you just pause for a moment and you don't just go over the story again, it's amazing what you may see that you've never seen before. I know that's the case for me. So for some of you, I'm sure this is going to be a reminder. And you're going to have to pray for me today because I might start preaching at some point. And I'm going to have to throttle back because there is so much in these verses. There is so much. And I'm going to try to stay focused, laser focused on motherhood. Uh, but if I wander a little, you'll forgive me. Won't you, Oliver? Will that be okay? Oliver says it's okay. So the rest of you, bear with us, all right? Come to Genesis chapter 1 for a second. We're going to just refresh ourselves with God's first description of the first family and how he created them, and that sets the tone. Genesis 1, beginning in verse 26. These, you know, these should not be controversial verses, but because of the deceptiveness of Satan and because of his divisiveness and destruction in the world, uh, even these verses can sometimes cause confusion and division. But let's, let's let the Holy Spirit guide us now as we, we read Gen Genesis beginning um, chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Okay, they're not on the screen. Hopefully you got a Bible that you can look at. Then God said, let us, you see the plurality of God, let us make man in our image. Okay, and there's a lot of debate about what that means, what the image of God is. But think of the plurality of God expressed there. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them, let them 
rule over the fish and the cattle and the sea and the birds of the sky and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps over the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The image of God is portrayed as a plurality. So is the image of God that we reflect in our relationships with one another. Eve was in Adam when God made Adam. She was in him. Okay? Adam was made in the image of God, and Eve is also equally made in the image of God. But it's in that plurality, in that unity, that we bear the image of God. It's much more than just character and values and things like that. Okay? Verse 28, notice this. God blessed them, and God said to them, the very first thing God is recorded in Scripture that God says to humanity the very first thing he says is, oh, it's so wonderful to see you. How are you feeling? No, be fruitful and multiply. Isn't it, has that ever struck you as an interesting thing, that that's the very first thing God would say to Adam and Eve? But here we have, recorded in Scripture, uh, in the context of Genesis 1, God expresses his creative intent, and he creates male and female in the image of God all on day 6. He opens up his mouth, and he speaks to them, and he says, My plan for you is just as I have given you life, as I have created, so have I given you the blessing of procreating. Okay? All of this in the context of bearing the image of God. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. Come down to verse 31. God saw all that he had made. Behold, it was good, very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. That's a pretty big day, right? That's a pretty big day. And I know we're familiar with it. Genesis 1, Eve is made in the image of God. She's an equal inheritor of the attributes, values, and holy character of God. Okay? Clearly expressed there. Adam and Eve, male and female, bear the image of God in so much as they bear unity with one another. Okay? And, and, and uh, invite you just to contemplate that on your own when you have time. Motherhood is implied in the first divine challenge to be fruitful and multiply. So we're introduced to parenthood. We're introduced to fatherhood. We're introduced to, to, to motherhood. The very first thing God says is you're going to be a mom. You need to be a mom. You need to be a dad. This is what I've given you. This is what the whole purpose is. The whole plan here is that you would take this beautiful gift that I've given you of life and you would then share it and, and create life as well. So motherhood is right there in the beginning. It's almost the first thing coming out of God's mouth. Motherhood, fatherhood as well. There's, Genesis 1 establishes Eve as an essential part of the perfect plan for paradise and procreation. Okay? And, and, and so that, that's Genesis 1. We're going to move on here because, uh, again, I could just uh, continue on these. There's so much symbolism and power and theology in these. Genesis 2, we see another paradigm, another angle of the creative story presented. We get more detail about what happened on that sixth day of creation. Okay, we kind of go back a few steps, and God gives us a, another picture of how this whole family started and what God's intent was. So let's pick up the story in Genesis 2 and verse 18. Okay, verse 18, we know there's some pre prologue there, an explanation of what's going on. But in verse 18, it says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. It's how my Bible translates it. It's one of those areas where almost no two Bibles translate that exactly the same way. Okay, that's how mine says, I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky. Moses is reminding us that God had raised everything up out of the ground. Adam himself is raised up out of the ground, but Eve will not be made that way. Eve is not going to be raised up out of the ground. God has a different plan for the creation of Eve. God looked and he says, it's not good for man to be alone. My creative purpose cannot be fulfilled, and Adam cannot fulfill his purpose if he's isolated and alone. I need to make someone for him, but they're not going to come up out of the ground. I have something special in mind for her. So, verse 21, I'm skipping down a little bit. So, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. By the way, this is all an image of the cross. Keep in mind, too, as, as Jesus went into a 
the sleep of death on the cross, and from his side flowed the blood and, and the creation of the bride. Anyways, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. He slept, he took one of the ribs, and closed up the flesh in that place. The Lord God fashioned the rib into the woman in which, from the rib from which he had taken from the man, and he brought her to him. He brought her to him. Now again, have you ever allowed your mind just to kind of play out what this experience may have looked like, what it would have been like? Keep in mind, so Adam, he goes into this deep sleep. He's, he's out. Okay, he's sedated. He's, it's a symbol of death at this point right now. He's, he's out. Okay, God does a miracle, okay, removes a rib and says, I'm not going to make her out of the ground. Okay, she's already in him. I'm just going to take her out. That's what I'm going to do right now. I'm taking her out and I'm going to fashion her. Adam wakes up. Now notice this. He doesn't wake up and there she is right by his side laying next to him. Oh, so nice to meet you. That's not how the Bible says it. It says that God brought her to him. Okay? So Adam wakes up. He is not, we have to get out of the evolutionary mindset when we think about the early stages of humanity. He is not a caveman. He is not a dumb, you know, barely above ape thinker. He's a glorified, highly intelligent man. He knows instantly when he wakes up, something's different. He understands, he knows that something has changed, that a part of his body is gone. There is an incompleteness in his body. He knows that immediately, and he looks up into the soft mist and the silhouetted shadows of the garden, and there, walking next to the side of God himself, is a creature he'd never seen before. And he recognizes immediately who and what that creature is. And we know that because the very next verse, it says, And God brought her to the man. He brings her along. And what does Adam do? He sings. He sings. Look at your Bible. If, the Bible doesn't, if your Bible does not have these next verses indented or highlighted or put in brackets or something, okay, the Hebrew is put into a prose or into a poetic stance so that Adam is literally singing at this point. He, okay, he is making poetry. Isn't that what should happen when you see the love of your life? Huh? Come on now. Doesn't your heart want to sing? That's exactly what Adam does. But look at what he says. He says, this is now bone of my bones. This is flesh of my flesh. He knows exactly what this is. This is the rib. Look what you've done, God. You have now returned to me that which was already mine. We are now going to be returned into the unity and the harmony of what your plan was for our life. This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She is called, she shall be called woman because she has been taken out of man. God did not tell Adam that. He simply knew it. He knew it and he sings out this poetic realization that that which was once incomplete, that was what, which was once not good, him being alone, has now been restored. And the plan of God can now move forward because Eve has now been brought into the picture. She's not been named yet, by the way. He calls her woman. He gives her an identifier. And um, we're going to learn a little bit more about her name. But just notice this. Eve is created as a response to the not good reality of, Al of Adam's aloneness. Adam was not to take Eve for granted, but to view her as an absolute gift from God. Genesis 2 presents Eve as the perfect answer to companionship and divine compassion. Now, I want us to be careful here. Just as men should not be chauvinistic and arrogant about, hey, we were created first, ha, 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 that means we're more important, nor should woman, women be, um, again, of the same mindset or, or arrogant and say, ha, 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 we were the last created, we're the most important, ha, ha, ha. This is about balance. Not that any of you have ever thought that, okay? That never happens. This is an a, a absolute beautiful tapestry of interwoven balance between the genders, okay? And it's when they come together that in harmony they then can uh, reflect the image of God, okay? The bone that was removed has now been returned, and as we come together, and, and Moses says here at the end of chapter 2, he says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall be joined and be joined to his wife, and they shall become what kind of flesh? One flesh. They started out as one flesh. Now they're returning to be one flesh, right? 
okay, as the story is progressing here. So chapter 2 of Genesis shows, and notice Adam's attitude towards Eve. He recognized her as part of himself. He's excited. He sings. But we know that in Genesis 3, the story takes a drastic turn. And this is where motherhood will come into the scene one more time, and we'll get to see how it plays out here in the story, directly affected by the fall. Just to summarize the story, as we remember, the woman's deceived by the serpent. Both Adam and Eve sin and hide from God. God asks Adam, have you eaten? Okay, calls out Adam. And now, this is only the second time Adam has spoken. Okay, the first time Adam speaks is when he sees Eve. He sees the woman, and he's singing. Oh, heart filled with love, filled with joy. Oh, uh, my aloneness has been satisfied. The compassion of God, the plan of God is fulfilled in my life. This beautiful, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. The very next time Adam opens his mouth is right here. God, have you, or God says to him, have you eaten of the tree? It was her. It was that woman. By the way, who gave me that woman? Oh yeah, you did, God. So you see how quickly sin damages relationships. You see how quickly, right in the story, sin has already ruined paradise. Have you eaten of the tree? Oh, it was that woman that you gave me, by the way. It's not my fault. It's actually your fault because you gave me this problem. See how quickly it happens? And then God pronounces judgment. And that's where I want to uh, spend just a moment or two with you here in Genesis chapter 3. Now, <clears throat> before I share this, again, like I said earlier about we've got to get out of the evolutionary mindset when we think about early man and the stories of the Bible of them being, you know, fools and, and ca- cavemen and things like that. We also have to get into the understanding that the judgments of God are never curses. The judgments of God are always expressions of love. God is love. And sometimes we have viewed the the passages of God's judgment after this as a curse. There is a curse involved. It's referred to the curse. But within these judgments, there's only two things that God curses. He curses the serpent and he curses the ground. He does not curse Eve and he does not curse Adam. There is judgment. There is consequences. But the purpose is not punishment. The purpose is not punitive. The purpose is redemptive. And it changes your thinking when you read the verses about this. If you're thinking them of just a wrathful God, angry with his creation, and wanting to get at him, well, then you're going to interpret these verses that way. But if you remember, from the moment this time came, the heart of God was broken, and his only motivation was the salvation of his creation, you are going to interpret these verses much different. Are you, are you with me? Is that Okay. Okay, we're not going to go through all of them because I'm really trying to focus just simply on the, um, the passages that are relevant to, to the topic today. So he, he pronounces judgment, he curses the serpent, and he says, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between her seed and your seed. Come to verse 16 of Genesis 3. That's where I want to kind of begin to, to highlight some things here. To the woman he said, this is the first time he directly addresses the woman with his judgment, not a curse, not a curse. The heart of a loving God seeking to bring redemption to his fallen creation. Okay? Keep that in mind. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your chain and pile and your pain in childbirth, and in pain you will bring forth children. Okay? And I've heard it said, oh, I've suffered the curse. Uh, you know, the curse. And when I had the babies, I've heard women, I've heard, you know, people say, when I had the babies, I had the curse. It was there. You know, I, that, that's, not an, uh, uh, that's not a healthy way, maybe if I could put it that way, of viewing what this judgment is. God is telling m- the mother. Notice, too, the very first thing God addresses with Eve is childbearing. And by the way, I think I've said this earlier to you. I think she was pregnant at this time. I think Eve was pregnant at this time. And I think I can prove it biblically. But not today, Kim. Not today. I'll let you chew on that. Okay. I'll tell the others, but not you, Kim. Not, not you. I, I think she was pregnant. Now, the first thing he addresses is motherhood. Motherhood. Okay. And now, again, I, I realize that I'm, I'm kind of walking into a territory that I am... Uh, 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 incapable of uh, directly addressing being a, a male uh, who, who's not had a baby, okay? 
But I think, I think, if I could share with you what God is trying to say, is just as I have experienced pain in bringing you forth and seeing you stumble, yet you are worth it to me, and I won't give up on you. So also will you experience pain when you bring forth children, but they will be worth it. They will be worth it. And, I, and just as you are willing to make that sacrifice to give them life and give them a chance, so too is that my goal for you. Remember, the relationship between mankind and God was, was um, uh, 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 affected by the fall. Okay, And the plan of God had to be uh, uh, shifted. It had to be put on pause, we might even say, when this came on. And God is telling humanity, he's telling Eve and he's telling humanity, there will be pain in this process moving forward, but it will be worth it because the end result is a beautiful life that you had a part in, in bringing forth. Okay? So, and again, we could spend a lot of time on each of these words and each of these nuances. I just want to share that, uh, you know, that is not intended to be a curse. Oh, and there have been two schools of thought. I'm going to just, a little rabbit trail here. Two schools of thought that I've heard on this um, from people uh, that have shared with me. One is that because this was God's prescription that women would have pain, then that means that women need to have pain when they bring forth child children, and therefore they shouldn't have uh, medication and they shouldn't have epidurals, and it's a sin to do that, because if you do that, you're not going to feel the pain, and then it's not going to be. I don't believe that for an instant, okay? I'm just sharing with you. I don't think that's accurate, okay? Um, and, and having my wife had, having three children and having a variety of, of ways that, that assisted with that, she had pain anyways, okay? It's not like you can go through it completely pain-free one way or the other, at least from what I have observed. And you always know that the pain is there. If not, why would you take the uh, measurements and, and the means to, uh, to lessen the pain anyway? So I don't endorse that type of thinking, okay, that it's wrong for you as a, as a woman to get an epidural or to have pain medication uh, ease the pain. I don't think that's what God is saying. The second thing that, that I've heard said about this is um, that that was only uh, before the cross, that the pain in childbirth was a, a pre-redemption or a pre-death uh, uh, of Jesus reality. But since Jesus has come, we've been set free from that. So if you really have faith, if you really, really believe hard, you won't have any pain in childbirth. And if you do, your faith, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Again, I, I just want to share with you as a pastor, I don't endorse that either. I don't think that's accurate either. And I, again, I, I have very close friends and family that, that have gotten very excited about that thinking. Uh, I don't think that's what God's meaning is in these verses. I think he's just expressing a reality of the way that creation is going to move forward this time. Just as pain has been introduced into this world through sin and my creation has suffered because of it, but it's worth it. It's worth it. Okay. The rest of it, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule, rule over for you. That's pre pretty self-explanatory to me. It's very simple. Uh, husbands are the leader and they just have to, you have to do everything the husband says. And I'm sorry, I got it right here, black and white. No, and it's been interpreted that, please, I'm, I'm being facetious. I'm being facetious. You may feel that way very strongly and I, I don't mean to, to uh, insult anyone. I don't think that's what it means there either. His, your desire for, be for your husband there's nothing wrong with a husband and spouse desiring one another, first and foremost. But in the language that Moses uses here, he, he's actually talking about because you have introduced this in your family, speaking to the, to the wife, she bringing the forbidden fruit to her husband, the, the desire is, is a description really of you're going to have to now work harder for a balance in your relationship. That's really what that word desire means, okay? When you look it up and understand, it doesn't just mean, oh, I love him and he's wonderful and he's handsome, I desire him. It's really more of a working word. It's gonna be more work for you to restore this relationship that's been damaged because of sin. And he shall rule over you. It's the same word used in Genesis 1 when it says that Adam and Eve were created to rule over the fish of the sea. It means to be a caretaker, a governance, it does not mean domineering, dictatorial authority, okay? And again, we could spend time on that and, uh, and uh, look at that more, but I don't want that to get us too sidetracked. So God initially addresses Eve in the context of her bearing children and said the plan now moving forward is that you're going to experience a pain to understand the pain that heaven goes through, but it'll be worth it. That's what I would like to say to you. 
Verses 18 and 19, he now addresses the man. Thorns and thistles are going to grow for you. You'll eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread until you turn to the ground, because from it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now, I want you to notice these verses here. Maybe you've seen this before. Maybe not. Okay, God is speaking to Adam now. He's receiving his consequence from a loving God, seeking his redemption. And he's given the instructions about what life is going to be like for him. He's going to have to work harder than he had before. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now, that's a description of death, right? He said you're going to die. You came from the dust. You came from the clay. You have uh, disobeyed, and you have cut yourself off from the source of life. You will now return to that dust. That's a reference to dust. Then verse 20, now, now the man called his wife's name Eve, <coughs> excuse me, because she was the mother of all the living. That's a very interesting place for that verse to be. And then the next verse almost goes right back to the story of the consequences of sin. Then the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Notice, it's another reference to death. Where did those garments of skin come from? Revelation calls Jesus the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. An animal died. So you have these two verses. You have, to dust you shall return, and God made for them garments of skin, two verses expressing and illustrating and talking about the consequences of sin and death, and right in between them, you have this almost parenthetical statement where Adam says, okay, I'm going to now give my wife a name. And I'm going to give her the name life. Death, life, death. Sandwiched between death, you have Adam looking to Eve and saying, the only hope for us moving forward is you. Your life. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. Okay, Eve, uh, uh, the Septuagint, when it translated that word, used the word life. Okay, and then it's from that Greek that we get them then translating, transliterating her name Eva. And then it goes into German as Eva. And then gets anglicized in English as Eve. That's where we get the name. In this moment, in this portion of the story, Adam now looks at his wife a whole new way. Remember that God had told Eve, it's through your seed, through your childbearing, that a Savior is going to come. So Adam, if you want to be saved, the only option you have is through her. <laughs> you can't do it on your own. The plan of God is that she will bear children and the people of faith will continue to bear children until one day a Savior, a divine uh, 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 incarnation of God will come through in the human race and then He will satisfy the demands of the law and provide grace and salvation to everyone who trusts and believes in Him. And the story takes a dramatic shift. Previously, he looked at Eve and said, God, it was her who did it. She did it. She gave it to me. You gave her to me. She's the problem. And then the judgments of God changes the story, and he now looks upon her with hope and the source of her salvation. And by the way, when you correctly understand the judgments of God, they always bring hope. They always bring hope. When you understand correctly the judgments of God, they should always uplift your soul. And draw you closer to him. Verse 20 sandwiched between the two verses about death. Eve's name means life or living. Previously, Adam had seen Eve as a problem, a troublemaker, a nuisance. Right? That's the story of the fall. Okay? But now, after hearing God's plan, he sees her as a source of salvation, as the mother of all living. And by the way, this also answers a little bit of that weird question in, in I think it's in 1 Timothy, where Paul says that women shall be saved through childbearing. You ever read that one before? Oh. I don't want you to think me a liar. 
You know, this is one of the reasons I, uh, it must be, oh yeah, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, the woman will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Now, to uh, a Bible student that is not uh, trying to look at the holistic picture of God, it, it's been interpreted as saying, well, a woman has to have babies or else they're not going to be saved. It's a reference, though, to the story of the fall. That it was the plan of God that through the bearing of children, the Savior would come. And every child that is born has the potential of God written in their DNA and has the opportunity to fulfill God's divine plan for their life. And it's a holy thing that happens whenever a child is born. A child born under any circumstances is a promise of God. God Adam now looks at Eve and he sees her as the mother of all life and the hope because if Eve can have a child then there's the hope that the Savior would one day come through the procreation of the human race so motherhood becomes the source of salvation for you and for me someone had to bear that child that was Jesus Someone had to accept that, and every child that is born is a beautiful gift that has that potential of understanding what God's plan is for their life. Eve, as a mother, will illustrate the plan of salvation by bearing the seed that will one day be the very Son of God. Adam's timing in this verse, in verse 20 of Genesis 3, is conspicuous. In his hour of need, he recognizes the power of a mother to give life. He sees Eve fulfilling that role. Eve, the first mother, offers hope. Isn't that what a mother does? What a mother should do? The challenge that every mother is faced with. Mothers represent life. They love and sacrifice. Mothers offer comfort and strength when we are scared, hurting, or alone. A humble mother, when led by the Holy Spirit, is the very embodiment of divine grace, compassion, and power. The power to love unconditionally, and for all time. It's interesting that when the Bible wants to talk about the unconditional love of God, it usually references God in the feminine. Like, you know, will a, a, a nursing mother forget her infant? Neither will they forget. If they, even they shall forget, for I will never forget you. As a mother hen gathers its chicks under its arm, so shall I gather my children under my arm. When you think even in the animal kingdom, what animals are known for being the most protective of their children? Mothers. Never come between a mother bear and her cubs, right? Right? It's the, you see this illustrated even in the fallen created world. The power to love unconditionally and for all time. I'm going to end with this little reference from um, Adventist Home. The sphere of the mother may be humble, but her influence, united with the fathers, is as abiding as eternity. Now listen to this. Next to God, the mother's power for good is the strongest known on earth. Next to God, the mother's power for good is the strongest known on earth. That's pretty powerful, guys. Did you mothers realize you had that power? Well, God bless you for it. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that you've given us this, this beautiful uh, awareness and realization of, of the story being played out here in the book of Genesis and how Eve came to see herself and how Adam came to see Eve as this powerful, um, hopeful solution it seems as though that she's often accused of being the, the, the first to fall. But you reverse the story, Lord, and you actually turn her into the source of salvation. So God, that is a, just a beautiful picture of how you turn things around and you make grace supreme. Lord, I just pray that you would bless all the moms in the church today. Lord, we need strong moms.
in our culture, in our society. Our children need moms. Even if they're not our, our own children, we need to see examples of moms. And we need to have the strength of moms who have borne that pain and labor and yet know that it's all worth it to bring forth that life. So God, thank you so much for the moms. Help them to see your plan. Help them to fulfill their role with grace, with beauty, with gentleness, and with strength. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again so much for being here today. God bless you. I hope that you have a wonderful Mother's Day officially tomorrow. Um, but we hope to see you next week as well. Happy Sabbath.